Morning, everybody. Is there anybody over here that's in my All right. What are your questions? What are your uh, What are your fears? All of it. <laughs> It's going to be easy this morning. Well, I haven't done the last two questions in the morning. Should we, should, we, should we dive in? Just, just, just full throttle straight into chapter 11 homework? Second to the last problem on the homework. Oh yeah, okay, so this is the closest thing to like a clutch type situation where you've got two rotating discs on some common axis. So visualization. Um, here, let me uh, we got an extra page here. So we have this like, please forgive me, I'm going to attempt to draw this in three dimensions. So we have like a disc and then there's like a, like a central axis that this disc is mounted on. Um, and it passes through the disc like that and then they said um, there's a there's another disc like I don't know maybe up here right and the top disc comes down and comes into contact with the second disc and they start spinning together. Right? Um, they rotate as one unit. They give me a moment of inertia and it's going counterclockwise. So spinning that way as seen from above. And then shenanigans ensue. Okay, so for part A, they're both spinning in the same direction, right? Both spinning in the same direction. They give me the moments of inertia, 3.65. And at 415 revolutions per minute. And then 8.61 for its moment of inertia, spinning at 953 revolutions per minute. And again, like this one comes down and couples or attaches to that second one, much like the clutch plate in your car would do. So, we want to know how fast, like, so before we have these two things spinning at different speeds with different moments of inertia, and then they come together and form one object. We want to find out how fast that new combined object is going. So, we're going to try conservation of angular momentum. And the reason I know to use conservation of angular momentum is not only is this the chapter on conservation of angular momentum, but... We have a collision. We have an interaction between two things. We know something about before. We want to know something about after. 
And that's a lot like the chapter nine linear collisions, right? We're in the middle of the sandwich. Luckily, in this particular problem, there's no brick. So what do we got to begin with? We have the angular momentum of the first disk and the angular momentum of the second disk separately. The system has both of those angular momentums. Afterwards, we have the angular momentum of the combination. Right? So there's lots of ways to write angular momentum. Let's see, we can do we can do a cross product, we can do an MVR, or we can do an I omega. And out of those three, what um, which is the more natural way to write down angular momentum? Again, in this particular problem. It's I omega. Because we have the moments of inertia, because they're giving us angular speeds, right? MVR is very particular to like an object that's going around in a circle, like a point mass, right? Going around in a circle. R cross P, you want to avoid unless you can't avoid it, right? Um, so in this case, because we know moments of inertia, we know angular speeds, let's go ahead and use I omega. So this is going to be I1 omega 1 plus I2 omega 2. And then afterwards, we're just gonna we're gonna keep we're gonna add the moments of inertia of the two objects together because they're one object. Their moments of inertia combined, just like masses would combine together. Their moments of inertia combined together, and then there's gonna be some sort of final angular speed, which is the speed that we're looking for. Now I've drawn vector signs over those omegas. They do have directions, but the problem I think told us something about that. The problem said. They're spinning counterclockwise, and we can take that as the positive direction, right? So when we plop in our numbers, right, we can put positive signs on for both of those omegas since they're both going in the same direction. So I want to solve this for the omega. I don't know. So it's going to be I1 omega 1 plus I2 omega 2. Stripped off the, sign, uh, the vector signs with uh, arrows because I'm going to use plus and minus to indicate my directions over I1 plus I2, and that's going to give me my omega. So now I just, I got to throw in a bunch of numbers, right? Uh, 3.65 plus, so it's 3.65 times a positive 415 revolutions per minute, plus an 8.61 and a plus 953 revolutions per minute, and I divide by 3.65 plus 8.61. Now the problem is asking me, oh, clever me, I kept the numbers up, all right? Um, it's asking me for units in revolutions per minute. So if I just keep everything in, I don't have to convert this into radians per second, which would be the standard unit. Since they're asking me for revolutions per minute, I, I might as well just keep everything in revolutions per minute. Um, it'll, all, it'll all work out. I didn't write my units down in here, but I've got 3.65 kilogram meter squared plus 8.61 kilogram meter squared divided by a kilogram meter squared. The kilogram meter squared is going to cancel out. All I'm going to be left with revolutions per minute. All right, so for part B, what happens is they set, I think, the top one going the opposite direction. So recycle the setup. Do we still have individual angular momentum before they come together? Yes. Do they combine after they come? Yes. What's the only difference now? The sign, right? So for part B, you're going to come in here and you're going to put a negative 953 on that one and see what you get. Okay, so if, if this turns out to be a negative number for part B, which way do you know that it's going? Yeah, it's going clockwise because we said counterclockwise was positive. What did they say? So clockwise is the actual answer for this setup. And so that means it reverse direction. That, that second one had enough moment of inertia to overcome the other moment of inertia the first one. Questions, comments, or concerns there? <clears throat> Oh.
Okay. This is close to something we've done together. In chapter 9, we did the cannonball hitting the ballistic pendulum. Okay. Only this time, we have a rod and a block. Right? These are things with mass. It's not just like a, a, a simple pendulum with a mass on the end or something like that, right? So we've got to take into account the moments of inertia of that rod and that block, as well as doing the conservation of angular momentum that happens when that bullet strikes the block. So um, they, they want to know, well, they're kind of stepping us through a little bit. Okay, they want the moment of inertia of the block rod bullet system about point A. So they're so basically in, in part A, they're just asking you to do a chapter 10 calculation for what the moment of, the, of inertia happens to be. So we'll do that over here. Okay, so the moment of inertia of the system, okay, is going to be the moment of inertia of the rod plus the moment of inertia of the block plus the moment of inertia of the bullet. Okay. So the question now becomes, uh, how can we find the moment of inertia of these things? How would I find the moment of inertia of the rod? Check the chart, Check the chart right? And on the chart, there is a moment of inertia for a rod that spun about an axis that's on its end, right? And I believe that that moment of inertia is one-third ml squared. Remember the other one's one-twelfth, that's when you spin it through the middle. Okay, so there's our rods moment of inertia, okay? The block, now is there an entry on the table for a block that is rotating about a point A that's like way outside of it? No. So what do we kind of default to when there isn't an obvious table entry? It's just mr squared. It's the mass of the block times how far away that block is from the axis point. And um, oh, Mr. Baylor should read more. <laughs> they told me the moment of inertia of the rod. <laughs> So I was trying to go calculate it when, in fact, they had just given me the moment of inertia rod. Nice of them. Okay. And then it even says, what are we going to do with the block? Treat it as a particle, right? So it's a particle. That means mass of our block times uh, whatever distance they give us. Yeah, they gave me the length of the rod. Okay. So I know it's mr squared. It's m times distance squared, right? And I'm just going to use capital L as the length of that rod. And then the bullet also being a particle, we will do uh, be symbolically consistent here, Mr. Bailo. Um, bullet will be mass of the bullet times length squared. There we go. All right, so we can add all those together. Since we know the mass of the bullet, we know the mass of the block. They gave us the moment of inertia of the rod, 0.0834. And again, that's that's not necessarily tied into chapter 11. They're just uh, kind of helping. They're trying to help you, sort of step you through, break it down. We are going to need the moment of inertia of this system. Okay, to figure out how fast the bullet was going. All right. So they now tell us in part B the angular speed just after impact. And they want to know the bullet speed just before impact. We are in, dare I say, a sandwich situation. Right? There's a before, there's an after, and then there's the conservation of momentum that's taking place in the middle. We've got something that for all intents and purposes, that bullet has linear momentum as it comes in, right? And then the system has angular momentum as it leaves. You don't want to mix linear and angular momentum. You want to do all angular momentum or all linear momentum. But if we say that the bullet, we need to find the angular momentum of the bullet right at impact. 
and right at impact, that bullet is like right here. And so it's got a distance L. It's a point particle. So what form of angular momentum are we going to use? Like which mathematical form of angular? Those three we've got, right? We've got R cross P, got MVR, and we've got I omega. MVR. Why is it MVR? Particle that's about to start going in a circle, right? At this moment, it's going to begin a circular path, right? So in that instance, we're going to go ahead and say that the angular momentum of the bullet is mass of the bullet V times R, but that R is L, right? We're, we're at the length of the rod there. Okay. Um, we know the mass of the bullet. Ooh, the V. The V right there is the V we're looking for, isn't it? How fast was the bullet going before impact? That's the angular momentum the bullet has right before impact. So if we do a conservation of angular momentum statement for the moment that things are interacting, then I've got mass of my bullet times V times L equals, and now afterwards, I have the moment of inertia of my system, which we found in part A, times the angular speed of my system, which they gave me as 1.86 radians per second. So now the only unknown thing I have in here is that uh, velocity. I know the length of the rod, I know the mass of the bullet, And now you know the range of answers because I failed to put it into uh, student mode. Apparently around 0.337. And around 1.8. So how do you know what to do and when? <laughs> you can't ask me when you share. <laughs> Guess? I mean, <laughs> guessing is worse than 50-50, right? Okay? That's a lot worse. If you're guessing on a physics exam, you're probably going to be right about 5% of the time. Unless you're guessing to square root of 2GH on all the problems, which case you probably have a 1 in 12. <laughs> That's not a problem. Um, you have to contextualize it with this concept that I know you guys don't want to be thinking about. You want to be fed equations and you just want to run equations, right? Uh, but what I'm testing you on is can you conceptually look at a problem and know, well, this is an angular momentum problem, right? Or this is a linear momentum problem. Or this is a rotation, you know, kinematics problem, okay? So spending time sitting down trying to categorize it. What are the things that I know this is angular momentum? Well, if things are colliding and they're spinning, it's probably angular momentum. Whereas if they're colliding and moving in straight lines, what kind of problem is that? That's linear conservation of momentum. And then you kind of know at that point, OK, I'm going to have some sort of sandwich somewhere. I've got to figure out what the sandwich looks like. Right? You start broad, and then you get detailed. You don't go the other way around. Um, how do you know when a problem is involving torques, like Newton's second law with torques? A pulley, that's like a specific example, but more generally, how do you know? Usually you've got some sort of alpha, some sort of angular acceleration that's being caused by forces and torques. So again, just like with Newton's second law in linear terms, if there's an acceleration, it's probably Newton's second law that you're dealing with. Like if forces are causing an object to change its motion, well, with torques, if forces are causing something to rotate, that's a torque. So it's probably going to involve Newton's second law. The way you know it's not Newton's second law and could be energy is if time and acceleration are even asked about or things that you need to find, in which case you might as well use energy because it's going to be faster. So, and if time's involved, what are you, what are you dealing with now? That, that's kinematic. Right? And of course, the possibility exists because of this unit, 
We've covered all the toolboxes in this unit, haven't we? Kinematics, Newton's laws, energy, and momentum are all coming together right now. Okay? So it's possible for you to have a problem that has momentum in it and conservation of energy. Maybe another problem that's got second law and kinematics in it. I think, I don't know, do we do you a disservice for the first nine weeks of the course? Um, pretending like all these things are separate, <laughs> when, when in fact the universe does not work that way. The universe uses all of them simultaneously. Second half of the course is pretty heavy. Did I see a question over here? No. Oh, yeah. I was going to ask apart people who use that on these energy elements. They specifically were asking for how fast is the bullet going. So because it's an inelastic collision, because the bullet sticks in the block, kinetic energy is not conserved. You, we would have to know the thermal properties of the block and how the energy is being dissipated chemically and altering chemical bonds to be able to use conservation energy. And at that point, you just go find a chemical. This is after they pull together? Uh, even, even in before. before. Yeah, I was doing B equals R omega. What are the radius? The angular speed of the skaters. So they come in opposite at 1.45 meters per second. Okay. They're separated by 2.23, but what is the distance? It's half of that, right? Because they're going to spin about the center since they, they have equal mass. If they didn't have equal mass, they would, they would spin about their center mass. But they're equal mass, so the center mass is right in the middle. So this distance is, is 2.23 divided by 2. And then we know that this one was going uh, 1.45. Right? The other one's doing exactly the same thing, but in reverse. So... V, this is what you tried? Yeah. Looks like it should work. Trusty scientific calculator. Uh -oh. Type correctly, 1.45, I got 1.3, not 1.115. One oh, I answered B. Thank you. So... Yeah, okay, I got I got I got omega for B. Calculator mistake? Um Wiley plus H2? Okay, so this is a good case for Wiley plus might be wrong. So email me. Okay. Right, just shoot me an email saying, Mr. Spill, I'm, I'm doing this and I can't. It's not good. It's Wiley plus very well could be wrong. What's changing in this problem? What's the collision in air quotes? They're pulling along the rod. They're changing the distance between them, which is changing what? Does it change the mass? No. So what does it change? Well, yeah, then the angular momentum actually stays constant. So because this other thing is changing, the omega will speed up. Masses are getting closer to each other. The moment of inertia. The moment of inertia of this system changes.
Other questions? It's always dangerous to have Mr. Baylor make up questions on the fly. Um, one popped into mind. I want to make it very clear, this will not be on your exam, this particular problem, because I feel like this particular problem is very hard. Okay, But it's useful Right? If you understand, in an ideal world, if you get this problem, you should be able to do any of sandwich type style problems ever. Okay? Um, I know in practice, a lot of times that doesn't I was just reading this morning a scholarly article where they researched um, classes of physics students. In one class, it was taught, quote unquote, normal traditional style. In the other class, they gave the students a booklet that contained like 120 questions in it and told them that their exams would have questions from the booklet. Like the exact questions that were in the booklet, you know, if, you're, if your exam's on Newton's laws and energy, then you're going to have questions from that section of the booklet. Not, it'll be the exact question, right? But maybe there's 10 questions on energy and they'll pick two. Right? You want to guess how well the students did, the ones that had the booklet that were told precisely what problems they were going to get on the exam, how well they did compared to the normal class? 200% better. 0% better. It made no difference. It means it doesn't matter if I do or not. Okay. <laughs> at least in that particular study, in that particular instance, and how they set it up. So, so what then is the issue? This is the more fascinating part of the article to me. You're both right. It was the trust level between the students and the teachers. Teachers that treated students as adversaries didn't make any difference. Teachers that treated students as part of the learning process and we're all figuring this out together, their students did better. Which one am I? Am I your adversary? <laughs> I started this class by telling you I wasn't, right? And I know some of you, a lot of you still believe I am, right? Because I sit there, ah, red pen, right? But. In spite of all the, wit all the evidence, I am still on your side. All right, so just to make it clear, right? I would consider this problem probably too hard to put on, like in an exam. It'd be a great homework problem. But possibly too hard to put in a um, homework problem. Okay. With that, what have we got? Um, a certain superhero that will not be named because of copyright issue, but shall we say uses possibly uses echolocation to find his victims? Where's black? Uses tools. Very rich. He is standing on the edge of a cliff and has hooked his um, device to a pole, a rod, something to hook it onto, right? And there is a bad guy who looks very much like somebody that's supposed to live in Antarctica. And the plan is for Echolocator Man to swing down, okay, grab person that resembles a flightless waterfowl from Antarctica and then continue swinging up to where a certain police chief is waiting with handcuffs 
to apprehend Cedric. We got the we got the we got the we got the picture in your minds here. Okay. So uh do you want numbers? Yeah. No, yes, no. I mean it doesn't matter to me. Numbers are better? You're number dependent? You gotta break you of the habit. How uh I mean what we're gonna do is we're gonna find out if this is possible, right? So uh, give me the height that um, Batman is above the penguin. 30 meters? Okay, so let's see here. If we get this all correct, that means 30 meters that way, which means it has to be 30 meters that way if Batman's taking a circular path, right? Arcing down, swinging, okay. And then uh, where's Commissioner Gordon? Like how high is he standing? 10 meters, okay, All right, and um, we well, need the mass of Batman, we need the mass of the penguin, mass of Batman. For reference, I am 70 kilograms, be careful. 90 kilograms, and the penguin was played by Danny DeVito. 120? Okay, so let, let's see, right? Let's see if we can suss this out. Let's see if we've got all the information that we need, right, to be able to figure this out. Again, our goal is to decide whether or not, okay, like Batman and the penguin, after Batman has grabbed the penguin, right, and is swinging upwards, right, whether that combination can make it up that 10 feet. So step number one. Is there an impact here? Is there a, are there objects interacting in some way? Yes, right? So with any kind of impact, we know we are in a conservation of momentum situation. Okay? The question then becomes, is it angular momentum? Is it linear momentum, right? What do we do here? So how do we decide whether or not we are going to use angular momentum here or linear momentum? Okay, you're looking at this going, well, there's all these arcing paths and everything, Mr. Bailey. And you're not wrong. There's arcing paths there. But in actuality, this is a linear momentum problem. Because right before the collision and right after the collision, both Batman and the Penguin and the combination of the two together are moving in straight lines. We, don't, we could use angular momentum and be just fine. Like we could figure out what the moments of inertia of Batman are and the Penguin are and all. But why do all of that if we don't have to? And how do I know we don't have to? The Batman and the Penguin are, for all intents and purposes, point particles, right? We're not being given any information about like, are they disks? Are they rods? Are they like extended objects, right? All of that came about because we had mass that was sort of distributed along a line or around a spherical ball or something like that. That's where you've got to go and reach for moment of inertia. But in terms of just objects colliding into each other, we treat this as we've treated it before we ever knew anything about rotation. Because this problem is the ballistic pendulum problem. Remember when we shot the cannonball into the catcher and found out how high it went? This is that problem. I know you're looking at it going, no way, Mr. Bailo, is this the same. The physics is exactly the same. Two objects interacting, one not moving, the other coming in. How high did they swing afterwards? All right. So with all of that being said, and again, hopefully you're writing down notes and going, OK. I didn't understand a word Mr. Bailo said, so I better go back and listen to that on YouTube. And if I still don't understand it, I've got less than 12 hours to ask somebody. 24. Less than 24 hours to ask somebody, right? So, <laughs> all right. What do we do? Where's, this, where's the sandwich meat? At what moment do we have the very middle of the sandwich? 
Yeah, right where they come into contact with each other, right? That's the collision right there. And so we're going to take a look right here at this collision, and we're going to say, well, whatever had momentum before, that same momentum is going to exist afterwards. And just prior to the collision, it was only the momentum of Batman. And again, if you tried to do this with angular terms, and you were careful, you would get exactly the same math out. Okay, you would. It, it would. It's kind of scary that way. But it all works consistently. All right. And then afterwards, we have the mass of Batman, the mass of the penguin, um, and then however fast they are moving after the collision. I'll call that V final. Okay. So from this statement right here of conservation of momentum, I know the masses of everything, but I have two velocities that I don't know. I don't know how fast Batman is going, and I need to find how fast Batman and the Penguin together are going so I can figure out how high they're going to go on the other side. So, first things first, how do we find out how fast Batman is going? We are outside this, we're, we're not in the middle of the sandwich anymore, are we? We're at the bread. And what do you do for bread? Kinematics, energy, Newton's laws, something else, right? Besides conservation of momentum. So me being me, which one am I gonna pick first? Energy, all the time, okay? Is there a way for me to set up conservation of energy to figure out how fast Batman is going? Well, let's see here. If I say that this is an initial point, and the final point is right before Batman strikes the penguin. And if I put zero at the lowest point Batman reaches, which is where the penguin is, then what have I got? I've got work other plus energy initial equals energy final. Is there any friction? As Batman sweeps down? No. Just the darkness that lives in his heart. What sort of uh, energy does Batman have way up there? Potential. Potential gravity, right? No springs up there. So it's just MGH Batman. And then what kind of energy does he have when he catches the penguin? It's all kinetic. We've seen this before. What's the answer? Square root of 2 GH. <laughs> 2 times 9.8 times 30. 2, 9.8, 30. Square root of twenty four point two meters per second. There we go. That's how fast Batman is going. Uh, going forty eight something miles an hour when he strikes the man. Good thing they're both wearing body armor, right? Okay, so now we know that. So what can we now find in the green? Do some algebra to find out how fast the pair are moving after the collision. So mass of Batman, 90. Mass of Batman, 24.2. All over 90 plus 120. Isn't it just fascinating to watch Mr. Baylor use his calculator? 24.2. Twenty, right? I got ten point four. It's by no means are accurate numbers because I'm doing them live, not having them done them before. Right? Okay. Now we know how fast they're going after. So how can we determine whether or not they make it to Commissioner Gordon? Ooh, we could. So we're in another piece of bread here, right? And again, it looks like another energy problem. 
because I can make an initial point, I can make a final point up here, Commissioner Gordon, and I can ask the question, right? Like, I could solve, I could find out what the speed would need to be in order for them to make it up 10 meters. Or I could use the speed that I now know and solve for a height. And if that height is more than 10 meters, then what do I know? They can make it. So you want to, use, you want to do it that way? All right, let's, let's solve for the height, okay, that it takes. So if I set zero right there, I put my initial at the bottom, my final at the top. I take any guesses as to what the answer is going to be? Square root of 2 gh. Let's prove it. Energy initially. Again, because it's, it's because there's no friction or any other sources of work in the problem. He starts with kinetic energy, ends with potential energy, gravity. The masses cancel out. Okay. And now instead of solving for V, which should be a square root of 2 GH, I'm going to solve for H, right? Which is going to be G, V, uh, no, is going to be V squared over 2 G. So I take my 10.4 and I square it and I divide by something that's close to 20. I'm not going to make it, I don't think, because that seems like it's really close to 5. 10.4 squared 9.82 maybe I should do math or arithmetic more often 5.52 uh, meters so what does that mean? It means Batman needs to catch smaller criminals right? because if the penguin mass is less well, it doesn't matter, does it? Mass canceled out, right? So what did Batman have to do instead? Yeah, it needs to go faster. So he either needs some sort of propulsion, some sort of work other to do his swinging or swing from a higher, longer rope. Or maybe Commissioner Gordon could just stand on the ground. Okay, break it down. What happened? Where did we start? I took you from a place of big concept, right? Like, is this momentum? Is it energy, right? What are we doing? We knew that we wanted, you know, Mason asked for a sandwich question, so I knew you knew the sandwich had to be involved in that. We decided whether it was linear or angular and you were tripped up, right? You were fooled into thinking, oh, well, it's swinging in it, right? But what was the dead giveaway that we could use linear here? They were like particles, right? They, and in that instant where they collide, they're moving in straight line. And without any other sort of, I mean, like I said, we could have done it with mr squared for their moments of inertia and omegas, right? We could have converted his V into an omega but we would have just actually ended up with exactly the same answers, right? Okay, um, Because of how that V equals R omega Google translation works. So either way, would have, you would have been fine. I just think that the angular version is slightly more involved. More calculations have to be done. Um, and then we took it from that into, okay, what is the sandwich really made out of? Now notice, this thought process is coming, is being driven by the concept, right? It's, it's not you're just looking at it, well, I'm going to start throwing math at this and see what sticks, okay? That's how you make spaghetti, right? Like you boil the pasta and you throw it against the wall until it sticks, right? You know, don't do that. How do you know when your pasta's done? You bite it. No, you taste it. It's food. It's supposed to go in your mouth, not on the wall. Right? Okay? So the next time you're tempted to throw your noodles at the wall, just try to imagine my Italian grandmother coming at you with a wooden stick. Okay? Wooden spoon. Because it's not what you do. You do. Besides actually tasting it, for some reason people don't want to try their pasta. I don't know what the deal is, right? Rather throw it against the wall and have to clean the wall. 
you can look at the pasta water. What happens to pasta when it's done? It releases starch into the water. The surface of the pasta will go from sort of like clear and nothing to a glistening, unctuous, starch-ready vehicle to capture sauce. That's pure pasta. Figure out. I don't know why I got on that tangent, but man, I want to figure <laughs> We take a lot of pride in noodles at my house. And we sometimes make our own. Fresh noodles. Sorry, where was I? What were we doing? Oh yeah, physics. From that sandwich, we took and we went into figuring out well we could use energy on both sides, and we knew we could use energy on both sides because they're not asking for how much time, right? Does it take? For Commissioner Gordon to catch them after they so, like if they if we want to know how much time it took then I can make a right a really horrible problem where maybe Commissioner Gordon's standing four meters above, right? And then you would have to use some sort of kinematics to find that time, right? Uh, how much torque gets applied to the penguin in the catch? Like there's, there's all kinds of horrible ways you can take this problem um, that I refuse to do to you on exam. Any explanation on how to So the, the, tools, the tools kind of tell you, right? In the kinematic equations, time shows up, right? Omega equals, uh, omega equals omega naught plus alpha t, right? The second one's got t. Third one doesn't have time in it. We'll give you that, right? Um, but, but the toolbox itself has got time floating around in it, right? So again, when time's involved, the only tool that we've given you to be able to work with time is kinematic. Power, we snuck time in talking when we talk about power, right? Because power was work divided by time. So sometimes time involves power, but then you'll know they're asking for like energy output or energy expenditure or the rate at which work is done. Those are like big giveaways for that's power not kinematics. When it comes to acceleration, this gets a little bit murkier because acceleration does exist in the kinematic equations, right? You got A's and you got alphas. But if you don't know like how fast something is going before and after or how far it went and you're just being asked, you know, this thing has got forces being applied to it, find its acceleration. That's Newton's second law, because Newton's second law is all about forces and accelerations. And then with energy, it's process of elimination, or really, can I get away with doing energy because it's faster and easier? <laughs> more, more succinct, right? And so again, if you don't care about time, you don't want to know about acceleration, try energy. The worst you're going to do is waste some time set, you know, figuring out that you need to do something else. Um, and then when it comes to momentum, whether it's angular or linear, is there that smack? Is there that interaction? Uh, something instant, right? All of our Newton's second law problems, we did chapters 5 and 6, or even in chapter 10 when we were doing torques, right? It was always the anteater, armadillo? Aardvark. Armored small animal started with an A. Sliding down a hill, right? How fast is it going? It never like ran into anything, right? We really didn't do any kind of run into anything until we got to chapter nine. So if you have objects that are knocking into each other, connecting to each other, sticking to each other, bouncing off of each other, now you know that you've got a sandwich situation. You've got a conservation momentum problem. That's probably gonna need bread on either side, or at least one side. Could be an open face sandwich. The hell? What if it's yeah, what if it's a lettuce wrap? Meh. Then um, I think it's more delicious because I don't like bread that much. But 
If you're going to have carbs, have noodles or rice. Don't mess around with bread. Unless it's a really good sourdough. It's nutrition advice from Mr. Bela. <laughs> I saw articles again touting another new superfood. Seen any of those articles lately? What's the new superfood? Hint, it's an old superfood. This comes up like at once every four years. It's broccoli again. I love broccoli. Given the choice between cake and broccoli, I will take broccoli 100% of the time. This cake is disgusting. It would have to be like 99% broccoli and 1% cake. Like, like, like. Part of it, it's 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 just nothing but sugar. Like cake is usually nothing but sugar. And a lot of you are going, well, yeah, Mr. Bailo, that's the point, right? Sugar brings me joy. I'm glad it brings you joy. Imagine your joy in having cake. That's the level of joy I experience when I eat broccoli. I love broccoli. Broccoli is amazing. And apparently it's superfood again, which means it's going to be more expensive in the stores because everybody's going to go buy it. Close related cauliflower. Yes? Thank you for stopping me for too many tangents. This is going to be a conceptual question, isn't it? Oh boy. Okay. Bubble gum, all right. Rank the paths according to the angle. Uh, okay, fine, I'll leave the question. We'll leave the answers up there. Rank the paths according to the angular speed that the slab and the gum will have that for the gun. So greatest. So we need to know which one of these is going to be going the fastest, right? So this is a momentum. Like, okay, we can go at this from momentum. We got it from torque. Like when I'm thinking about all the ways I can approach some kind of rotation, right? I've got energy, I've got torques, I've got angular momentum, right? Um, angular momentum scares me, so let's think about that last. Energy, I really like energy, but this thing is changing its motion, right? It's going from not rotating to some kind of rotation. And so what is that concept? When you're changing the motion of something, Newton's second law. that's it's acceleration. It's Newton's second law. So let's think about this from from a point of view of a torque. Okay, the one that's going to provide the greatest amount of speed, the biggest acceleration, is going to be the one that applies the greatest amount of torque. I can see three of those vectors right now that give exactly zero torque. Which three will provide exactly zero torque? Two, three, two, three, and five. Why are two, three, and five going to give zero torque? They're not perpendicular, right? They're heading straight towards the center of that object. And that is exactly like trying to apply a force directly towards the hinge, right? It's not going to cause any kind of rotation. And, you know, part of your struggle in learning is being able to see that this and that are the same. Physics doesn't try to have separate ideas for all these different situations. It's one idea for all the situations. All right, so we got, we got, we got, we eliminated three of them: two, three, and five. Okay, so that leaves one. Four, six, and seven, uh, all doing various amounts of torque. So the question is, which one of these is the largest? Now, all of these forces, we'll think of all of these arrows as forces. All these forces are identical. So what's the only thing that's different? Oh, I agree. Torque can be thought of as a cross product. 
uh, Mr. Baylow's method was to try to pull off, right, a, you know, what is perpendicular kind of thing. So either way we want to do this. So if all of the forces are identical, what's the only thing that's changing? Yeah, the distance, right? So the other thing that technically is changing is the angle between them. Right? Which one of these is the most perpendicular? It's four, isn't it? Okay. Four, and they even drew the 90 degree angle there for us, didn't they? Right? So number four is perfectly perpendicular. Right? Um, let's take a look at six. So the distance to six. Six is like, that's the R right there, isn't it? And you've got to kind of move everything up. So the R is like this. It's got, it's got the same distance as 4, doesn't it? Right? Same exact distance as 4. But is that force perpendicular to that distance? Not at all, right? So we'd have to pick off a component that's perpendicular to that distance which means that we're lessening the torque here, right? There's a part of that force that is parallel to that distance. There's a part of that force that's perpendicular. But unlike 4, you know, 4 had R like this, and then all of the force being exactly perpendicular, right? That's a maximum amount of torque. This one right here is going to be less than 4, okay? This being 6. All right, bless you. Again, isn't it great to have the heating malfunctioning and having to keep the doors open all the time? I've been having to scream less because if I scream, the other teachers get mad. Something about interrupting their lectures. What are they lecturing on? Chemistry? Just applied physics. All right, so what about seven? What's going on with seven? What's different about seven? Is seven acting at the same distance as six and four? Yes. What do you tell me about like the, the angle that seven makes there? So it's kind of like there's the R and there's the F. Like how parallel is seven to that distance compared to say six? It's more parallel, right? It's more of seven is pointing in the same plane as R, direction as R. So if I had to pick, I'd say four is the greatest, followed by six, followed by seven, and then the other, th uh, how many do I have? What did I miss? Oh, one! Didn't do one. What's going on with one? Smaller distance, right? Okay, and fairly parallel to each other. So I would get, I, this is hard to tell. I'm going to say it's smaller than seven, just as a guess. Oh, there's the answer. So did I get it right? Four, six, seven, one, and then two, three, and five are all the same. And the reason I called one less than seven is because its angle, it was like very close to being like parallel to R and the distance was shorter. Conceptually, they're, they're trying to figure out if you can see that torque depends not only on how far away a force acts, but also how perpendicular that force is. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> I was looking at him like that because I was like, oh my gosh, which one's my right hand? Um, 
so hard for me. Like, number one, I'm dyslexic, so I have trouble with directions anyway. But number two, what hand am I holding up? My right, but when I point this way, what direction is that? <laughs> it's right for me and it's left for you. So I have to flip a flip in my brain, which is already flipped in some random direction that my brain has decided. It's a miracle I can teach anything. Uh, do we want to do it in the context of the first conceptual question? <laughs> On the homework? Did you just give up on this one? Yeah, you just clicked until you got it and moved on? Don't do that. I mean, do that, but then figure out why. And by figure out why, I mean physics, not how to clip. So, which of these forces produces a torque that is parallel to y? In other words, we need a torque that points up or down, right, along the y-axis. Um, and this is kind of kind of rotated a little bit screwy, right? I think you're used to having x, like maybe down here, right, and y over there, and z going that way. Grow up. <laughs> Coordinate systems can rotate whichever direction you need them to. But um, I would probably I would rotate this diagram if it were me. Um, I would I would try to flatten this diagram as much as I could to see what was going on. What do I mean by that? Um, I could draw the y-axis and the x-axis with z coming like at me out of the screen. And then that means point A is sitting right here, right, with force number two acting like that and force number three acting like that. Which way is force number one acting? Coming like out of the screen at me, right? Okay. For me, like, and if you've had graphics, and you're doing two, 10, two, 11, six, two, okay? They teach you how to draw those perspective diagrams, right? This is this, is, this, is this. okay. So, um, torque. Okay, and, and Kyle asked me about right-hand rule, and this is about right-hand rule. Okay? Because the distance, right, uh, it's a torque about the origin. So our distance starts at the origin and goes up to where the force is acting. So if I'm going to do a right-hand rule to find the direction for a torque, I need to know R and F, and I need to know their directions. So let's do, let's do two and three before we get to one, okay? So I'm doing a cross product, and I'm gonna use the right hand rule to find a cross product, so is that hitchhiker or pew pew? Pew pew, right? And so index finger goes where? Goes along the direction of the radius, right? And you can rotate your wrist however you want, right? It's just you gotta get your middle finger to go like in the wherever the force is acting in that direction right okay so you can start with a big pew pew right okay you go desert eagle and then you go to night right okay <laughs> but like you see how i start with r and then i go i bring it down to right if i'm holding my hand like this i can't okay if you're causing physical pain while doing the right hand rule you're doing it wrong <laughs> We don't do physical pain in physics. Mental and emotional trauma is fine, but physical pain, no. That's, that's what PE is all about, right? Okay, so you, you bring your finger down, and which way is my thumb pointing? It's pointing into the screen, right? Okay, and what direction is into the screen? It's negative Z, but it's Z, right? It's along the Z axis. That's not what the question was asked. They want Y axis, right? So I eliminate three as being a torque that's directed in the y-axis. Okay, what about two? How would, I, how would I do the right hand rule for two? Start with big pew pew, right, okay? And then I've got to bring my finger like it's two is down here, isn't it? Okay, so my thumb is still pointing which way? 
into the screen. So two doesn't work either because into or out of the screen is along the z-axis. Okay, what about one? This is good. This one is a little bit harder to picture, right? Because it's kind of going in and out of the screen. But I would I would take my fingers, right? Okay, and now I've got to get my my middle finger to point out of the screen, don't I? So I've got to rotate my wrist. I've got to keep my index finger along R, and I've got to bring my Right, okay. And now which way is my thumb pointing? Somewhere else that's not along the way. Right? So it's like pointing kind of in the XY plane, isn't it? Some screwy direction. So, yeah. None of those work out. Right? Okay. So let's check four, five, and six. So here, again, I'm going to I'm going to rotate my drawing, right? And the way I'm going to rotate my drawing for 4, 5, and 6 is I'm going to have my x-axis along here, and I'm going to have my z-axis along here. I'm like, I'm like trying to step up and look down, right? And so this is my picture of looking down. And if this is my picture of looking down, I've got point B over here. That means 5 is going to be like this, 6 is going to be like that, and then what direction is 4 in my drawing? Like coming out of the screen at me, right? And so again, I've got my distance right there, and I've got my forces. So uh, let's do four. It's the hardest one. Let's do it first. Okay. So I've got to get my got to get my fingers going in the direction of R, and then I've got to rotate my wrist so that four can come out of the screen. And my thumb is like pointing. It's like pointing in some some direction like this, right? And is that the y-axis? No, it's like in the xz plane, so that, 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 that doesn't work. Okay, what about 5 and 6? All right, so I go r, right, and I got it. Okay, and then I've got to come and bring this. I want, I want something that looks like this, right? I've got to bring my middle finger in the direction of 5. And I don't have to get the angle exactly right. I just know it's like on this side, right? If I was holding it like this, it wouldn't be working, right? Five is over here. And what direction is my thumb pointing? It's pointing out of the screen. And what direction is out of the screen if that's x and that's z? That's y. So five has a torque that points along the y-axis. What about six? Fingers. I don't like. Uh, like, uh, six is kind of going out that way, right? Kind of doing this awkwardly. Uh, but my thumb is still pointing out of the screen. I can't get, I can't, I'm not double jointed in my shoulders. Line that up correctly for you, but. Both five and six have torques that are parallel to the y axis, pointing in or out of the screen from that. Did I answer your question? Uh, when we did our quiz together, right? Which ones have um, angular momentum about point A? Remember the circle? Remember the box? Remember the line? No. No. <laughs> so there was the the circle clockwise or counterclockwise? Clockwise. Okay. What direction is the angular momentum of this particle? into the board. You wrap your fingers around in the direction it's rotating, and which way is your thumb pointed? Into the board. What if instead of giving you omega, I gave you that the tangential V was in that direction? You would do R, so there's R, okay, and you would do V, cross product V, and which way is your thumb pointing? Still pointing into the board. Um, for uh, left or right? Right. Okay. So if the particle's here and this is the point, you now know because you were tricked, right? On the quiz, you know that this has angular momentum, does it not? Okay. What direction is the angular momentum pointed? 
if this point P represents like an axis, a reference point, you would draw the radius down there. This is V, which means this is also the direction of momentum. So how would you find the angular momentum about point P? R, V, which way is my thumb pointed? Out of the north, out of the page. Okay. Or I could say that V is sort of wrapping around at this instant, right? It's moving this way. Wrap my fingers around, which way is my thumb pointing? Out of the board. Um, try not to overthink the right hand rule. Distinguish. You have a system for knowing, right? Am I using pew pew or am I using hitchhiker? Um, not sure what else I can say. Don't confuse up, down, left, right, in, out. On a piece of paper, which way is left? Okay. Which way is right? Which way is up? In the plane of the paper, point it up. Which way is down? In the plane of the paper, point it down. Left, right, up, and down all lie in the same plane. So how do we describe the direction this way? Out. Coming out of the page. And how do we describe the direction going this way? In. That's standard vocabulary for talking about three dimensions on two-dimensional surfaces. 4B students are out in the hallway going through post-traumatic stress disorder. How's the PTSD? Yeah? Remembering 4B? Oh, Mr. Ragsdale's out there taunting me too. That's good. You can do this. You're intelligent, you're smart, you're amazing. I know you don't believe me, but you are. Was it? When you're solving the network problem, are you going to have to use networks? So, yes, because force and torque is the same thing, uh, but different. Um, Yes, you add the torques together to find the net torque, just like we add forces together to find the net force. Kind of like in the bowling problem where you had to also find attention. Yeah. Yeah. Is that always like on Depends on whether or not something is accelerating. Do you try to remember everything that has happened to you or that you've done to be sitting in this seat right here? You've come a long way, and you can keep doing it. You'll be all right. I'll see you tomorrow.